Welcome, everybody, uh, to this conference in the series of the Distinguished Lectures in Earth Science. And uh, before introducing briefly really the, the, the guest of, the, of today, I uh, will just uh, uh, advertise the next conferences. Uh, we will have uh, on the 20th, that is uh, Monday, uh, from the 20th of November, we will have Bo Bateson. Look for him to work and don't miss the conference. He's a, he's a mineralogist, he is the director of the Deep Carbon Observatory. He was even a, a professional musician. He was the first trumpeter of the orchestra of Philadelphia. Uh, he retired a few years ago. So he was both a great scientist and a great musician. Uh, so, how many things that are so good? So, the 20 is uh, Obeyton, and uh, uh, we will run this seminar in the uh, <laughs> room of the biology department, the council room, because it's bigger than our groups, and uh, we will attract several people from other departments, so we decided to conference them. And uh, on the 22, uh, we will have uh, Elisabetta Erba, they already announced this one. Elisabetta Erba, even if you are a landslide person, you probably know her. She's a microbiologist and paleoclimatologist. She was and she served as the president of the Italian Geological Society a few years ago. Uh, she's a, a, a EGU power team. She won the Lama Medal for Stratigraphy a couple of years ago. And he's one of the most cited scientists uh, in Italy. And he will give a lecture on uh, nanoprocess and polyplug and global change. Oh, 23, I can't remember. I announced, I announced the seminar, but I <laughs> forgot. Uh, anyway, you, you will receive a reminder. Uh, the, the guest of uh, this evening is Ben Mears from uh, the United States Geological Survey. We covered the logo. No, it's there. Okay, the logo is there. So it's probably the biggest uh, uh, state uh, uh, which research is sufficient uh, to earth sciences. Uh, by far much larger than our geological study, of course. And uh, uh, the, the topic of this seminar is developing tools for landslide risk reduction across the United States, hydrometeorological thresholds to susceptibility maps. Please, Dan, I don't know if it works. If it doesn't work, I will just pass the slide. Good. Uh, thank you very much. It's a uh, big shoes to Phil, and uh, it's a real honor to be here for this distinguished lecture, so thank you for your attention. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this past year, I was uh, lucky enough to be a visiting fellow at the Swiss Federal Institute in uh, Bermersdorf in Switzerland. So they funded some of my travel here and, and helped arrange uh, some of the work that I'll, I'll uh, talk about. But mostly today, um, I'll talk about two parallel efforts that the US Geological Survey is working on related to landslide loss, uh, risk reduction, um, and hopefully it will be of interest uh, to, to Italy as well with uh, your landslide problem, but a different, um, different approach. Um, okay. Ah, it does That's work. me. That's you. Like that's you. One was you, one was me. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, just because, well, I see some familiar faces, but some of you I know less, so I thought I'd spend just one minute talking about my background. I've always been very interested in steep landscapes, beautiful mountains, and how do they evolve, but also what hazards do they present uh, to people and, and to society. Um, my PhD and, and most of my research uh, was actually in hydrogeology and looking at groundwater modeling um, and then looking at some of the first coupled surface water and groundwater modeling approaches and how we look at Earth's, uh, Earth's water flow in a systematic and, and quantitative way. So that's really influenced a lot of my work and approach. Um, and then in the end, one of the reasons I'm very happy to work for the US Geological Survey is that most of our science helps inform products that help society and things that will really help benefit the economy, people, uh, et cetera. And it's, it's not only theoretical. So um, that's sort of the, some of the three principles that underpin some of my work. <clears throat> Landslides are big problem, they're damaging, they're deadly, disruptive, three Ds um, in the United States and Italy as well. This is just some photos uh, from recent, relatively recent landslides in the United States. Um, yeah, it's maybe <laughs> bitterness. Uh, 
They happen all over the world. This is the landslide I was fortunate to visit in Sri Lanka. You see how they happen here. Um, they start high up in mountains, but then they can travel great distances and fortunately often kill people. In the United States, um, we've uh, yeah, paid too much. much. <laughs> uh, in the United States, we've had a number of fatal landslides over the past uh, decade or so from Alaska, California. Uh, so notable ones, this is in Haynes in 2020, Sitka and 2015, I'll talk about this, Alaska. This is a probably pretty famous one, the Oso landslide in uh, Washington state. Uh, this is in Colorado, here where I'm stationed and in California. And so uh, it was pretty big from the very big landslides to not very big landslides. Um, And one type of landslide that we have in the United States that I won't talk about today, but maybe increasingly uh, of interest in Italy, is post fire debris flows and burn a landscape, and that actually uh, increases the potential for runoff generated flows that can be quite deadly. This uh, event in 2018 killed 23 people and um, damaged some pretty high value property over the over for the third. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, so this is the point. Um, lastly, the, the landslides you know where they're going to happen and how they're going to happen. It's okay, but often they're unexpected um, and they can cut off critical infrastructure. This is a big problem in California, the Big Sur, Blood Creek landslide, which blocked Tower One uh, for many months, the only access in and out from many, many residents of California on the coast. Puerto Rico, over 70,000 landslides disrupted roads and, and transportation networks, power. And following Hurricane Maria, it is estimated that about 3,000 people died as a consequence of the storm of this hurricane, most of which from the disruption of transportation and electricity. Locations. So it's, it's a really big problem. Um, and so in, in uh, 2021, not too long ago, uh, the US passed uh, a new law, the National Landslides Preparedness Act directed us to the most survey to develop a national strategy for landslide loss reduction. I think we're a little behind on that front than some other countries in Europe that have a, a good national coordination on this. Um, so, some of the main things that it, it prioritized was uh, a risk reduction program and uh, coordinating amongst federal agencies. So, we now uh, have more resources to work with the National Weather Service to uh, weather forecast, landslide forecasting. Um, the um, National Science Foundation for Funding Landslide Research and um, other interagency programs. And, and so, in particular, uh, expanded early warning for landslides. Um, and then, at one in particular was developing a report to Congress, which I was really happy to be a part of uh, this national strategy for landslide. So, this is a, probably not that, it's a long read, not that interesting. Um, some of the details are. are Thanks, I'll touch on this talk. Um, yeah, I'm good. Okay. So, uh, the things that we already had in place before this, uh, this strategy was some real time monitoring of rainfall and some surface hydrological processes. I'm going to talk about a few of the sites today. They're all over the country. This map is probably small for everyone in the back, but uh, we have sites up and down the West Coast, from Colorado and some here in the East Coast. Puerto Rico and Southeast Alaska, and the ones uh, that I've labeled are the ones I'll talk about briefly. There's a video. Oh. Uh, Which one? The right, the far right. Yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, yeah, it comes. So, as you're watching the station tour, we know what's going to happen here. We know landslides happen where they've happened before. Um, and you can see yeah. here, it's been a landslide. Um, and even a small landslide can have really good consequences. And so there's two things that we like to do for landslide loss reduction. One is knowing where landslide is from. Well, in some ways, we know they haven't really happened before, but they've happened frequently before. So that's sort of the where landslides repeat themselves. We can develop susceptibility to experience. Talk about that at the end of the talk. Um, Perhaps more importantly, is in areas where we know they're going to happen, is when are they going to happen? Um, and we're not exactly sure which minute the landslide is going to happen here, 
uh, but we know it's going to happen. So if we know exactly when, or, or more or less when it's going to happen, then we can change our behavior. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we can avoid putting a train here or having a train transporting people uh, below the tracks. This is the Alaska railway line between Seattle and Everett cities on the west coast of Washington State. Uh, people uh, go on this train. And uh, so, as you can see, a small landslide can have a big But if we know when this is going to happen, or maybe just a few hours or days around when it's going to happen, then we can take uh, take action and kind of take it more. Yes. So, uh, one of the long standing tools. Next? Yeah, yes. Uh, for <laughs> landslide mass reduction are empirical thresholds for rainfall, um, rainfall on these landslides. We can use how hard it is rain. So, on the right, this is just a simple intensity duration curve. How hard is it raining for how long has it been raining? On the left, it's a different kind of threshold that three day recent rainfall versus 15 day cumulative precipitation before. And so we can use these as tools to understand when that's like been likely, just based only on rainfall behavior. Um, and so these are in operation for Seattle. But there's two different kinds of thresholds, and it can be sort of confusing why this one, why this one, well, if it rains hard enough or if it's been raining long enough. Um, and so we still use these, I should say, but, uh, but there's room for improvement. And one of the big advantages is we can have this threshold. Um, this is plotting the recent antecedent. doesn't matter what's on the axes. What matters is, is what's happening now and what might happen with uh, tomorrow's rainfall. That's rainfall tomorrow, I think. Uh, what will happen? So this, this is a useful tool because it's easy to interpret, uh, but it's based on historical rainfall data. And in the changing world, uh, we don't know that the past conditions of rainfall are necessarily uh, what might um, it's also you can uh, establish an empirical rainfall threshold like this for one region, but you can't use it everywhere in the United States. So we have to sort of develop a better cognition and understanding. Um, there's no there's no physics in here. Um, so how can we maybe start to insert some physics? Um, this is this is not my work. This is from uh, uh, David Paris's paper, but has a nice illustration that. There's no perfect prediction of landslides with a rainfall threshold. We just got intensity and duration. You can have sort of a risk averse threshold that um, all the green dots here are rainfall events without landslides. Red dots are. Um, so you can have a threshold with no false alarms. I can read it the next slide too. Um, you could also develop this threshold with no failed alarms, but that's also not very useful. Um, and so we, in landslide science, work in this sort of uh, matrix of mm -hmm. did the landslide happen and was it correctly forecasted? Yes. Uh, or no landslide happened and we correctly forecasted that. But what we want to avoid mm -hmm. is uh, a landslide happens and we miss that or no landslide happens. Sorry, the yeah. way around. But you get the point that, uh, mm -hmm. that if we forecast the landslide, we want there to be a landslide. Forecast the landslide. Um, so, one of the ways that we can start thinking about improving rainfall thresholds is projecting the hydrology. We know basic physics, a, a landslide, there's a water table around below the surface. You add water, you're going to increase uh, the soil from the dry conditions to fully saturated. And if you have some knowledge of where the soil moisture is or where the groundwater levels are, then you have a better understanding of what rainfall conditions might trigger the landslide. So we have two, this is uh, one example of hydrologic monitoring. And if you're saying that, I simply it's move the, the microphone. No, no, okay, yeah. so you can uh, look at the screen and I still have the microphone close okay. where you are speaking. Can everyone online here? No, it's okay. Um, this is that same railway line that I showed the video um, between Seattle and Seattle is down here and Everett. Uh, and we monitor two transects of volumetric water content, which is uh, how wet is the soil, tensiometers, which measures the matrix potential of the soil, and shallow bosometers measuring the groundwater level fluctuations. And um, two different transects, one for an existing landslide here in red, and one for a vegetated hill slope in the background here, um, very close to each other, just 500 meters apart. And so now we actually have this data plotting in real time. We can look, I can sit in the comfort of my desk and I can see what's the tensiometer doing, how wet are the soils in Seattle. Um, and it's simple, we installed some equipment, covered our tracks here, covered everything up, and then we have this data plotting in real time. Um, 
and in, in multiple locations that across the country. This is one example. Um, and the idea, this is motivated by um, lots of people's work, but uh, in 2018, Roberto Greco and Tom Bogar published this idea of a hydrometeorological threshold. I thought I can, I can do this with our Seattle data. We can look at, um, at the antecedent soil moisture conditions on one axis and the rainfall conditions. Instead of intensity duration or the current and recent rainfall, we can look at the hydrology on at least one axis here and leverage that in situ moisture data to improve uh, thresholds. And so that's what we did. Um, uh, for those of you not familiar with receiver operator characteristics, we have this, this false positive rate on the x-axis, the true positive rate on the y-axis, and perfect model is never wrong, it's only right. The, this is mostly me, um, I'm always wrong, but this is useful too. Um, so what's not so useful is a random guess. And so we can develop models that explore the space. Um, I, I won't get into too much detail, but essentially a good model will plot a better model will plot closer to this top left corner here. I we have the most true positives and the least false negatives and false positives. Uh, so at some point, we kind of have to develop some compromises that uh, minimize false alarms um, and minimize failed alarms because you can't have a problem. Uh, but um, in the end, what we found for a number of studies around the Western US is that you can reduce the number of false alarms and failed alarms by accounting for the hydrological and the sea conditions. And this has been looked at by a number of other studies uh, in Italy as well. Um, but uh, one of the things that was interesting to me here, we developed this, this is purely um, uh, automated learning. I won't say machine learning, but we automated the optimization of this, this threshold. You kind of see there's one here uh, and one here. Actually, can you hit next? There's this one landslide that really bothered me um, because we have really rarely observed conditions here um, with dry soil and a lot of rainfall and um, few observations in these kinds of conditions. And I was curious, is this real or not? Um, and what I found digging into our Seattle data is, is actually some interesting things about landslide recurrence. Um, so this is a tangent. Uh, we had a lot of monitoring data. Uh, this is, uh, you definitely can't see this, so hit next. <laughs> I summarize what happened here. We have two landslides, uh, two uh, hill slopes that we were monitoring, a landslide site and a vegetative hill slope. This is from October to May, landslide season in Seattle, and the antecedent pore water pressures measured in the vegetative hill slope and the landslide. And actually what, what we observed is that the landslide was wetter at the beginning of the year. It got wetter earlier in the year and it stayed wetter throughout the landslide season. And so you have these landslides that are wetter all the time and more prone to reactivation because it takes less rainfall to trigger a landslide. And that's exactly what we observed. Uh, next slide. Uh, up top is our landslide monitoring site and our vegetated site. And I'm sorry if you can't see the details, but actually we recorded the time of a landslide here when a, a pore pressure sensor failed and started kicking out here. There's a series of wet storms in Seattle. The landslide site started wetter. This is the pore pressure during here. Then our vegetated site starts at negative three kPa versus right around zero. Um, so it wets up quicker, stays wetter throughout the number of storms and then fails. Yeah, so that's, we observed this process of landslide recurrence um, and the hydrologic reason from it. So there's some additional side benefits from hydrologic monitoring. This, this helped inform some work that I published in, in WR and also some work with um, Arnaud Tome and uh, also presented Jaws on um, landslide recurrence of the, the hydrologic. Um, whoops, it's working. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it works. I'll leave that. Yeah, you better. Um, another interesting thing from landslide. Uh, hydrologic monitors, you can understand why landslides happen in one location and not necessarily another. This is uh, her, this is Puerto Rico, and I mentioned Hurricane Maria triggered 7,000 landslides across this very small island. Um, but the density of landslides is highly variable, and in some areas it was much denser than in other regions. And so we established these monitoring sites, one in some of the densest landsliding in Toronto, and some in some lower density landslide monitoring, um, like here. Uh, Toro Negro, and these are different soils uh, and associated with different geologic terrains, but, but hydrologically, we wanted to know the explanation for those. And so, um, 
This uh, is Toro Negro, the lower density landslide site. And what we're looking at is the soil water retention curve, soil water content versus pore water pressures. And this is Utuado where there are more landslides. And so interestingly enough, there's actually more storage available, more um, kind of change in water content for the, the same change in pore water pressure where there are more landslides. And that's actually um, an interesting observation. Well, that doesn't initially, you think this, this is always wetter in Utuado, uh, in Toro Negro. So why were there not more landslides there? Well, actually, the landscape has evolved to accommodate this less storage, and so there's more runoff. Uh, whereas in Utuado, there isn't a well developed runoff drainage network. And so, um, what I did here with the postdoc, we plotted these simple dimensions, dimensionless ratios of infiltration capacity to hydraulic conductivity. So, how much rain is coming in, how fast is the rain coming in versus how fast can it infiltrate? And then the total store, uh, total amount of rainfall storms versus unsaturated storage. And what we found is that Utuado, who plots down here, is really mostly accommodating with subsurface flow. So every single rainstorm gets accommodated with the subsurface, and that leads to higher pore water pressure development because a really big rainstorm, all that water can get into the subsurface. Whereas at, at Toro Negro, a lot of that becomes runoff, it's infiltration excess or saturation excess, and so the landscape is developed to water off um, through surface drainage networks as opposed to the subsurface. Okay. The really big storm, it's ready for it, as you thought it was not. Um, uh, one more monitoring site in San Francisco. Um, there's, there's, we have monitoring sites all around the San Francisco Bay Area. But this one I'll talk about is the vault one. And you can see there's a little land site here right by our site. Um, we have full water pressure sensors and water nitrogen water content sensors. Yes. And um, these, go ahead. Uh, these, we were monitoring this during a really widespread landslide event in 2017, uh, which resulted in millions of dollars of damage. These homes don't look that exciting, but San Francisco is a very expensive place. So a couple million dollars for these homes. Um, someone here just, uh, the, the homeowner was actually upstairs and was able to survive this. The sea landslide in fact fall out. Um, but there were almost 9,000 landslides in the region. So this was an exciting event that we captured the monitoring data during this, this widespread event. And so a postdoc of mine used um, this hydrologic monitoring data, um, kind of just quickly point out water content and pore water pressures. And during the landslide events, we had actually a sequence of storms in January and February, we observed positive pore water pressures. And the rest of the data was not. Um, and so we were able to use this. We calibrated a physics based model. He used, um, used that to calibrate the model. And then he took um, 12,000 storms and uh, 50 different initial conditions and developed a bunch of different parameterizations. And it came up with a total of 4 million simulations of uh, response to hypothetical storms. Here's that. Develop these dirt deterministic thresholds for pore water pressure and factor of safety. And then if you go to the next slide, um, this is this is what that looked like. So with the simulations, just an infiltration model, you could develop this um, rainfall versus antecedent soil moisture threshold, and it compared pretty well to historical events mm -hmm. 1982, 1998, and these 2017 storms that did generate landslides. This is a storm in 2016 that didn't, but developed positive pore water pressures. So we can tell that this threshold is actually, at least, at least in this realm right here, pretty good. So this is another way with, with a few years of monitoring data and a model we can extrapolate in time to, to understand less like triggering conditions. We are here. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> so um, this brings up an interesting point. Um, we, do, we have these empirical thresholds for saturation versus rainfall and deterministic. And this has a, a form that, admittedly, it's, it's not very uh, satisfying, but we just parameterize this very simple bilinear threshold. This is not a functional formula, but this is the, the deterministic threshold from the simulations. On the right here, this is, um, again, this is a student of, of uh, David Paris looking at uh, density of non-triggering events, triggering events, involving also a hydrometeorological threshold. And they're all sort of different formats. 
Um, and this is sort of an early field and we don't know exactly what, what should these formats look like? Should they have this sort of a, a step function? Should they be this curve linear like this? Should they be bilinear like this? Um, and so this is a, a figure from this uh, paper I'm working on with Roberto and others and kind of trying to understand what should these look like? Um, we, have, we know that antecedent moisture is usually important, not always. Uh, we know that the rainfall conditions are obviously triggering the landslide, um, but we have these different functional formulas and they might, they might vary differently in space and, and for different locations. We just don't have enough observations from enough different kinds of landslides to know what to expect if you go to a new location and, uh, and want to develop better. So, in my view, at least, we really need a lot more measurements and modeling to understand where are our models failing, uh, models for infiltration and drainage of hill slopes, um, where are observations failing. If we don't have a lot of conditions here, this is where that landslide repetition of the recurring landslide is observed. Um, why does our model here predict unconditionally unstable conditions as soon as we get kind of above a certain wetness, whereas in many settings, we observe soils that are stable at that level. So, um, so I think there's some open questions still that need to be explored, and I think more more measurements are needed for physics-based analysis. <laughs> so just this is one example from. Uh, we got that. Back. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> I was no, no, no. It's okay. Uh, there was supposed to be an animation where this didn't show up at the beginning because there's a landslide scar right here. You can see where it traveled down, and uh, right here there was a home uh, with three people at the landslide destroyed the home. And so we established um, a few years after that established a monitor site right, right more or less here on the hill slope to monitor pore water pressure, shallow water table fluctuations, and um, so temperature and, and rainfall. And this is a series of the pore water pressure in blue, purple, two different monitoring pits, and some soil moisture sensors as well. And then soil water content, rainfall intensity for one, two, and three. It's really blue light pink um, for the three landslide inducing storms in each of and you can see that there's different information content in all the different sensors. So the soil moisture contents are not necessarily always useful. Um, this pore water pressure sensor measures a nice continuous record versus this purple one um, is only active during some of the most landslide inducing storms. So we can learn a lot from these. Um, I won't for time get too much into detail. But I think uh, one of the really interesting things is we can plot this probabilistically. So this is full water pressure on the x-axis, volumetric water content, and uh, a three-hour rainfall intensity threshold. Sorry, this is really small at the back, but we're looking at this probabilistically in terms of the sedance fraction, a cumulative distribution function. Um, and all the landslide events plot really high here in terms of uh, being close to kind of 95% uh, in sedance. Same with this rainfall threshold. But the soil moisture is, is varies kind of 60 to 100% exceeding. So it's not as useful in I can see that in here. So this, we can look at things differently and start to think about um, in the same way that people look at rainfall exceeds thresholds, we can look at hydrologic exceeds thresholds that have more and more measurements um, in space and time. Um, and then I think the big challenge. I was talking about satellite uh, so much the products of people earlier today is how do we take one point measurement and learn more about what's happening across the landscape? Um, one of the products that at least recent research has pointed to being the most promising for landslide potential is SNAP. But this is an example of one SNAP grid cell, nine by nine kilometers. You can see there's a lot of variability within this one pixel of SNAP grid. And what we did is compare this. Our, our monitoring site, uh, ball one that I talked about is right around here. So we compared um, ground-based measurements, the black line here, and the SNAP measurements, the gray line here, in the time before landslide season, after landslide season, and then during landslide season with uh, these red bars being those four landslide events that I talked about earlier in the same 
And what you can see, there's this big divergence, especially during landslide season. Before landslide season, you put the big plot pretty close to the one to one line. After landslide season, there's sort of a bias, but they sort of have this nice correlation. But during landslide season, it's a mess. And we see the reason for that is that our observations track this really sharp increase and decrease in polar other pressures of water content during storm events. And that's not captured at sort of this nine by nine pixel scale. So um, some might argue it's, it's sort of an issue of how do we take this information and translate it into a better time series. But I think there's still a really strong value of putting something in the ground and measuring what's actually happening there. Um, so that's sort of a very fast tour of what we're doing recently from hydrometeorological thresholds. Um, about halfway through, the second half is shorter though. So are there any questions or, or brief discussion points? Should we save that for the end? Want to go to the end? Hmm. I think ultimately our goal is to try to improve landslide forecasting nationally, mandated a lot. And uh, maybe what I've shown you is pretty promising and exciting. Um, we can do a lot with monitoring, modeling, and analysis. Um, and the challenge, though, is that we have really not a clear path and not a one size fits all approach to using hydrologic information for landslide forecasting. Um, and now I'm just showing quickly some perspective of the scale. Um, this is just the continental United States compared to, to Italy here. Um, so each of these little blobs here is one weather forecasting office, uh, and the USGS has been directed to coordinate with the Weather Service. So it's 122 different offices we have to coordinate with for landslide forecasting. Some are more advanced than others, um, but the, the, you can kind of imagine just the scale of the different processes, different triggering conditions, um, different sort of climate that we're dealing with. Um, so I talked about one little forecasting officer here for Seattle, and one for uh, Juno, Sitka, um, one for San Francisco, and um, it's it's really just starting to scratch the surface of what we have to do. We have landslides, different sizes, shapes, um, flavors of landslides, as they all over the US and different triggering. Um, so when we, when we have, but we want to think about not just when landslides are going to happen, but where they're going to happen. We know they've happened or they haven't frequently in the past, but we also want to know where the unexpected landslide is going to happen. Um, and so we have all these different triggering from earthquakes. Um, we can even have landslides triggered from heat fluctuations in proximity, um, from intense rainfall or sustained rainfall. So um, it's a real challenge, but we want to, um, in the broadest sense, understand across the country where our landslide is going to happen. And the way that that's typically done is with landslide susceptibility maps. Um, this is just a, an example from a number of recent studies of landslide susceptibility maps. This is for the state of Oregon. This is a, a landslide, a debris flow susceptibility map for the Western US. And it's just a slope map. Where is the slope greater than 25 degrees? This is an interesting study published by uh, some, um, folks at CNR and uh, the collaborators in, in China looking at. Um, simple threshold for where landslides possible and not possible across the globe. Um, just get the paper. Uh, this is Puerto Rico susceptibility map. And this is a, a, the kind of maybe arguably most famous uh, landslide susceptibility map used in the NASA uh, LASA product for landslide susceptibility. So th this is some examples. And we had uh, two existing products that were used mostly for the continental US. Um, on the left is a topographic slope relief threshold published by Jonathan Gottman in 2012. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about this. And then on the right is a uh, geologic susceptibility map. So based just on landslide occurrence within different geologic units. Um, and looking at the density of landslides within those units uh, in 1982. The USGS published this map, which is a really uh, heroic effort at the time, but it's at one to 750 million scale and just for commerce. And so it's um, has some, we wanted to look at how, how well do, do these two maps that are currently in use in the US perform. 
and one of the folks would go back on saying, we have no idea how many land sides were used to develop this. Um, it was just uh, a handful of experts at USGS at the time in the 1970s sat down, looked at maps, and decided subjectively, based on land slide, the land slides they knew about which um, which geologic units should have the most land sides. And you can see it's very, they were stationed here in Reston, Virginia, and it's very focused on the eastern United States. Um, and we know that there's a lot of land slides in the West Coast, maybe not as well. Um, and this map on the left was developed empirically with 30,000 land slides, which sounds like a lot. So we thought, okay, if we're going to do a new susceptibility map for the US, we need to figure out more where are all the land slides happening because we need more data. Um, and so that was the idea here. In 2018, we started this effort to put together all the land slides across the United States just from existing published maps. And I knew, um, at least at the time that we started, Italy had 600,000 land sites now. I don't know how many are now, but 600,000 in Italy. I thought, okay, we only got 300,000 for the US, so we're still missing some. Version two, we had 600,000, so now we have the same number mapped. We're clearly missing a lot of land sites. It's an incomplete data set, but it gives us a really good sense of um, some data, foundational data to start building some sense. So it shows you how powerful the kind of garden is like mapping. You can see that some of these sort of correspond to the areas you saw in the previous susceptibility maps. And I didn't include Alaska because they, we have no problem with Alaska. Um, it's an interactive map, which you're curious. Um, check this out uh, and you can zoom in and in and in and see different uh, landslide polygons and points. And I'll just point out the colors that you see here. We've made an initial effort to understand the quality of landslide mapping. So it's a very just categorical variable. Was the landslide map with high resolution negative with LIDAR? Um, and just to put some simple script, we assigned a confidence level. And I maybe in retrospect want to revisit the color scheme, but the dark red ones are high quality mapping, and the orange dots are sort of media reports or lower quality landslide mapping. So we wanted to evaluate how well do these four existing maps do at capturing landslides across the United States. So this is a busy figure. Um, it's making me hungry for pizza. But uh, I think what, the point here, this is the USGS 1982 map and the USGS topographic map. This is the NASA LASA model. And this is that um, global non-susceptibility map developed with the TNR and Chinese group. And what we looked at on the left here are the number of landslides captured in, in percentage. So this is landslides captured, landslides captured by the different susceptibility classes. So the bottom ones are simple. There's some and none. Um, so this one captures 79% of the landslides and misses 21%. And then on the right side is this land surface area. So 32% of the land surface area it has some landslide susceptibility and 68% has none. So, um, you capture 80% of the landslides and 32% of the landslides. It's sort of this trade off between um, false alarms and capturing landslides. So that's, that's what's shown here. And I guess um, you can dig in, and a lot of this is published in the paper. Um, but the interesting thing is that a lot of the landslides, for example, in this map, are happening 31% of the landslides are in the low susceptibility class. If you look at the NASA model, 40% of the landslides are in this moderate susceptibility class. So this is kind of concerning because moderate, people are usually okay with a moderate risk level. Uh, you know, while driving traffic in Naples, that's maybe higher than moderate. Um, well, not with me driving, it's very high, but with, with Leo, it's, it's much safer. Um, but so that this, this is an issue because there's this sort of misleading, um, you know, only half of the landslides in this model and, and maybe a little more than half in the, the USGS model are in this high susceptibility zone. And so we actually think that some of these simpler models that say some versus none might be a more useful approach at the broad scale of the land, land use plan. So we decided to use this approach in developing the next model. Um, so just a review, this is how the approach was developed. Uh, on the left here, is the cumulative frequency distribution of slope for different landslide inventories and cumulative frequency distribution of relief for five different landslides from New Jersey, San Francisco, Oregon, New Mexico, and North Carolina. 
And uh, what that it all did was took, took the 10% uh, human frequency exceedance, plot the slope for that and the relief for that, and developed a simple linear threshold for some versus none. Um, Landslide susceptibility. So any, anything with 75 meters of relief or more uh, at a slope greater than about 14 degrees, you have some landslide hazard. Uh, if the relief is 100, me 100 meters, then anything above 18 degrees has some landslide hazard. So a really simple approach, just using local relief and topographic slopes. And this is a map of that. that uh, sorry, it's probably way bad in the map. Uh, but you can see with our inventory plot on top, um, mostly it's. So we thought, but well, we can improve this, um, especially because there's a lot of landslides. Scott Law used 30,000 landslides and 90 meter DM, uh, produced a one kilometer resolution map just for CONUS. CONUS is the, the lower 48 states of Hawaii. And they didn't evaluate their model at all. They just produced it and said, here's something uh, that might be useful. And actually, it turned out to be very useful. In this case. So we updated it with um, an order of magnitude more landslides with a 10 meter resolution DEM uh, to produce a 98 meter resolution map. Um, we did include Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Uh, we evaluated it with independent data sets. I won't have time to get into that. And we tested four different models. And they did 50 different independent runs with some split sampling. So we were really confident that this model was uh, robust and not influenced by the specific data sets. And we, we tested with linear regression um, two different slopes one where we weighted by landslide density and one unweighted. This is just got just did the unweighted. I won't get into this for time. Uh, next, we also tested nonlinear models, which is also what, what this. Uh, uh, March is senior about published for Italy in 2014, and then that, that was the same method that was used globally by Gia et al. in 2021. Uh, but we also tested a 10% quantile uh, model. So anyway, slope relief, and here are these different non-linear thresholds, and we tested those as well, uh, and produced a map. It looks probably the same to you as the existing map, but it's 90 meter resolution instead of one kilometer, and it does, as a result, it does a lot better in terms of um, this is now looking at percent of landslides captured versus percent of land surface area of different models. And the main thing you can see here is that we capture 99% of the landslides press with just 40% of the land surface area, which is better than if you do different combinations of the NASA model, um, different the non-susceptibility map for Chia et al. and older models that capture more landslides, and we have a better ratio of those. But this wasn't good enough for me. I felt like, okay, we can go back. Um, this is not a very exciting map. It's not very colorful. Not so colorful. Um, and so what we did, we can move forward two slides. Um, we produced the 10 meter product, but we thought that was too detailed. And so instead what we did, we downsampled this 90 meter to a 90 meter grid cell. Um, this is a one 10, this is a, a cartoon, but a one, 10 meter grid cell within any 90 meter pixel, or one 10 meter pixel within any, any 90 meter grid cell, we've determined this terrain has some potential for landslides. So anything in our model um, has this, has at least one or more pixel within a grid cell that could produce a landslide. But there's different densities. So this is an example of three, 77 or 80. And these, these range anywhere from one to 81 pixels per grid cell could produce some landslide sensibility. So I, I thought, well, there's a lot of information content here that we got rid of. What, what does this look like if we were to actually publish the density of landslide susceptible terrain within each grid cell of a model? So that's what we see here. Um, and so you can see there's, there's quite a bit of variability across the country. I just did equal intervals here um, of um, pixels. But now you can see that there's this increasing density of landslide from terrain along the west coast and in, in the Appalachian mountain range on the east coast. And there's still some landslide susceptible terrain in the middle of the country. We know we've observed landslides here, but there's just not as much of it. So this helps kind of make that variability across the country. 
this is a, a sort of new approach because typically it's just looking at high, moderate, and low probability of lymphocyte as opposed to how much lymphocyte prone terrain is there within a the um, We looked at that in the, the context of, of this is that cutoff from zero to 81 and how many landslides are we missing at different cutoff levels. And really 75% of the landslides in our inventory are happening in this highest density landslide terrain. So this actually seems like a pretty good proxy for landslide susceptibility. It's how, how much, how dense is the landslide from terrain at the So I just want, wanted to zoom in and show one example for Seattle. This is where we have that landslide monitoring site I talked about here. This is Puget Sound, Seattle is right here. Okay. And right along the coast where we have all those landslides is where we have some of that highest uh, landslide country. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll kind of try to close um, next slide. What we, what we were hoping for is a uniform nationwide uh, hazard of where landslides could occur and improve the accuracy and precision over existing models. And I think we did that with the gridded model, improved resolution and performance, and also kind of new methods to quantify variability in landslide detection. But still, there's this very diverse terrain across the entire US, and so there's, there's still challenges. Um, we don't know about regional variability, so the geologic contributes to us with in our uh, national landslide system. Um, and just to let you know, we've got volcanoes in the US too. Um, so that's probably one of the ones right now. Thanks so much for your attention and interest, and hopefully, just questions or discussion. So we start with a question from the room, and then we take questions from the online audience. Please. I see Leo with the tens of questions. Uh, written in this one. <laughs> so so I, I want to ask you about the last one, challenges. So yeah. particular uh, regarding the early uh, possible early warning systems and how Based on rainfall or monitoring hydrological, so hydrological condition, how uh, it can be applied in different geological conditions. Because I mean, when we about hydrological pressure, we think, uh, especially in shallow lands, and so we think the shallower uh, geological system. Which is not uh, homogeneous, but depending on on background. So, so how to manage possibly this measure? Yeah, um, I think it's really hard. That that was part of this example in Puerto Rico. It's just a few kilometers apart, very different hydrologic responses related to different geologic terrain, different soil formation. They are experiencing the same climate. Uh, but the underlying geology and soil evolution and structure that you're starting from and sort of the erosional landscape is um, very hard. I think what we don't have right now is sort of enough monitoring networks and steep lanes across different geologic conditions to understand. But I think there's room uh, maybe to start synthesizing with models to understand you know, what's the similarity between our caustic deposits here, the Sarno Mountains. And Sitka, which is the set there's Mount Edgecombe is a volcano right across from Sitka. It's very similar uh, geologically in terms of the power plastic soil deposits, but very different climate. And so maybe we can start uh, and some of the, the work of Francesco published comparing different uh, regions within Italy. What are the different trade conditions? How does that relate to different hydraulic soil thickness? So synthesizing uh, to understand are there general relations with soil water storage with Infiltration capacity and the storm type that the trigger landslides to uh, generate simpler conceptual models for this hydro. Not a good answer, but maybe more monitoring in different locations and then synthesis with modeling and identifying different <coughs> key parameters and controls.
questions from the landslide person. Either here, no question yet. Question from the audience online, please just open your microphone and ask your question. Tell your name before asking the question, please. Bunch of really shy so like. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I can yeah, yeah. Just, just a curiosity to share uh, some opinions uh, because uh, when you show susceptibility maps, it becomes clear that you have uh, find a trade off between uh, simplicity and detail. And I think this is true as well if you want to base your uh, dynamic hazard evaluation on monitoring system, because you cannot monitor with detail everything. So I see that sometimes we are very much demanding on uh, the quality of the results provided by models and monitored, interpreted by models, much more than we are when we compile maps. What is your opinion? I mean, for instance, you said we are now monitoring uh, in real time several locations, but these several locations quantitatively, quantitative, what does it mean compared to the, to the expansion of the US? So what will be, in your opinion, the balance, the, the balance reasonably? Yeah. Um... That's a challenging question um, and good point. I think um, I think as always, um, I guess first of all, there's there's two questions that we're sort of trying to bring together: is where and when right. yes. of landslides. And you can see I started with very different uh, approaches: a very general approach to where, a very specific approach to when. Um, and the specific approach to when is started. And in places where we know landslides happen all the time. And so there we start with the detailed approach to understand when they're going to happen because we know they're happening in this area. But then the susceptibility map is on the most general side. We know some of the worst areas, Seattle, and, but we know that there are also places with less people on that side that we'd like to move to. On that level, we start with the broadest brush is can we develop a uniform product so that you can equitably understand? variability in the inside the country. Then I think you can't use a map like that for detail. You know, we use that for the most general comparison of prostate. So here in Italy you maybe have a more benefit if you a specific detail map to be able to understand better. For us, this is not, a, not an option at all yet. Um, so I hope that this big map will inform bigger picture questions about where do we focus resources on detail and studies mm -hmm. of the right side. Whether that's uh, for early morning or for better susceptibility. Mm -hmm. so, um, as far as the, the, the detailed monitoring that we have, that's selected based on where we know lane sites happen all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's where we want to try to understand the controls of our because you know we'll observe lane slide events like the San Francisco pipeline and the 2017 slides. Um, we're not going to put a lane slide monitoring site in North Dakota and hope for a lane slide. Eventually, a landslide may happen there <laughs> eventually. But um, so I think we kind of start at these two ends to understand, hopefully, eventually bring together this idea of a hazard map that can predict when and where mm -hmm. landslides happen. I think I dodged your question. Uh, I think that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Curiosity uh, Did you ever work with insurances company? I mean, an insurance no. company should be interested in where, yes. not, not, is, not what, uh, when, they don't care when, yeah, they just not want to no, know where, they care also where. Well, actually, they care a lot about the ah, The frequency, yes, yes, but not exactly the forecast. No, they don't care when, but they want to know how often. Yeah, no, um, of course. And so that's a very important question, and, and unfortunately, for landslide science, it's negatively impacted in the US because there's no landslide insurance. Mm -hmm. So there's earthquake insurance, mm -hmm. uh, and we know very well what earthquakes cost in terms of damage. And very little understanding about the frequency and magnitude of landslide events in terms of because of mm -hmm. 
Um, and so we are starting to try to understand the whole reports and side damage and frequency of, of occurrence, but um, the constraints on how often and side events happen and how damage can be is, is almost. That actually this this dot at all susceptibility is, is motivated. We need a national map to mm -hmm. understand so that it sh so that we can have land size insurance. Mm -hmm. But we still don't they want us to know the frequency as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Please. Please. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Which one? Uh slide where you compare three different thresholds. Linear yes, if I remember well. Those this one. Okay. Sure, you can ask the question. Yes. Uh, oh, this one? No, no, back, 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 back. 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 The first half, the end of the first half. Yeah. This one, this one. Yes. This one. In the center, how yeah. did you get to the, the range from? How did we? Yes. Here? Here, yes. yes. Um, this is, how did we measure it? Yeah, this is based on the real. This is based on, um, well, I guess I could go back one slide. Uh, um, I remember it was a synthetic. Uh, yes. Really, so this, yeah. this, these uh, storms are real storms. And um, we calibrated this model. This is four and a half million simulations with synthetic rainfall events. Yeah, how do we define that? Yeah. Ah, so this is a post because process. What my question is, if yeah. you change the definition of events, yes. Did you get did you get the same threshold with the uh, same uh, so months for the, the events? Actually, no, because what we did was took seven two hour rainfall, and of course you get a different threshold for a different rainfall a duration. But we took the seventy two hour rainfall because this is a subjective decision. But many of the storms in San Francisco are two plus days; it'll rain for two or more days before we decide to trade. Um, and so we took 72 hour rainfall totals. The storm definition, I forget what Matt used. Um, it's in the GRL paper, I can send it if you like, but, but he um, essentially defined the storm criteria that it's used by the weather service to define it an event. And of course, you get a different threshold with different, um, different event characteristics. But this 72 hour rainfall is subjective. Now, there's a lot of subjectivity. Decisions. Good uh, modeling. Yeah. You have got. You can decide. Yes, exactly. I mean, four and a half million storms. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, no, it's four and a half million. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, one question from there. Yeah. 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 Uh, within uh, our very, very interesting uh, experimental sites, uh, are there uh, evidence the ground circulation, uh, share of the ground circulation, fair uh, trade uh, yes. active? Uh, yes. I uh, think free. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, what is the, the bank of Apifers in the side? I don't, I don't think so. I don't know about bedrock aquifers. Um, but I guess so, in, in my mind, an aquifer is sort of a, an exploitable resource for groundwater. But is there, per, is there enough perch water um, that there's sustained perch water year round? Yes, 100%. So this, um, the Sit tags and we'll make this alert. Can you go back and forth forward? Uh, one more here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just leave, yeah. leave it here. So this uh, this monitoring station where we got this data is located right here, nearly the top of very steep down. This is about a 40, 40 degree slope to so very steep. Um, there's 
there's not an aquifer in here, but it rains enough that there is constantly, this is pore water pressure and KPA at a, a slope at about 55 centimeters. So if you go half a meter down, we have constant saturation, constant positive pore water pressures year round. And the only time that we see landslides is when this perch saturation is so widespread mm -hmm. that it's connected across the entire coast. So um, this is this soil pit um, with the purple lines only responds. This is half, also half a meter deep. There's only a response there during the biggest storms. So whereas what I didn't mention, these soil pits are both here, 10 meters apart on a very steep coast slope. And so there's some parts of the very steep coast slope that constantly support the shallow groundwater, some parts just a few meters away that are very well drained. And it's only when it's connected across all these locations um, where we see strong response that, that we have that side. So that's um, sort of the cognition we get from monitoring here. Um, Which type of paper? This is the pyroclastic soil. Um, on top, uh, there's no, no actually underneath the pyroclastic soils is glacial deposits. <laughs> They're a very dense glacial clay, okay. and the water perches on that. Yeah. So yeah, it's not not really bad at all. But clay. So, yeah, so, so and then underneath the glacier is uh, the volcanic plastic mm -hmm. rocks. Okay, yeah. right. there's perch soccer for you. I guess to answer your question. So, case this was the last. Yeah. Thank you again, Matt. Thank Thanks a lot. Nice presentation. Thank you all for attending the, the seminar. And see you at the next seminar. Bye bye. Bye bye, you online also.